Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Our God can indeed heal. And I believe that when we recognize His authority, that releases a situation. It creates the atmosphere for healing to take place. In other words, healings just don't happen. There are spiritual ingredients which are necessary, which, which produces the situation where healings will take place. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 8. The book of Matthew and chapter 8. Now, Yeshua has been talking about, and we studied last week, this important concept of authority, recognizing Messiah's authority over one's life, recognizing the authority of His Word. It was because this centurion heard of Yeshua that he acted in faith, this correlation between faith and hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And now we're going to see, after speaking about his authority and a right response to it, we're going to see a healing. Look with me, Matthew chapter 8, verse 14. And Yeshua, coming into the house of Peter, this is Simon Peter, one of the disciples. Yeshua coming into the house of Peter, he saw his mother-in-law, and the same word having been cast down, it's usually used as an idiom for lying, lying in bed. And she had a fever. So this fever, this sickness. Now, in this case, there's nothing... Uh, uh, overtly spiritual about this disease. She was simply sick. Sick with some virus perhaps, some infection. We don't know what it is, but, but we are led to believe it was a natural sickness. Not like what we talked about last week with leprosy. Not something that we'll talk about later with demonic influence. She was simply sick. She was bedridden and she had this, this fever. And thus we see in the passage, and Yeshua, he touched her hand, and the fever left. And notice something. If your Bible says she got up, it's incorrect. It's in the passive. She was made to get up. Now, this is important because it's teaching us every time there's a miracle, that miracle is done in a way it's related to us in a manner in order for us to understand spiritual truth. And when we look here, we see that she was made to get up. And this rising up, that was an outcome of Yeshua's power being released in her life, bringing her to health. She experienced and healing. And when you have experienced the touch of Messiah, when you have received His healing influence, it is going to raise you up and being lifted up. And that's what it literally means. She was lifted up. And what did she do? Notice what the scripture says. And she served them. She ministered to them. So when we are recipient of God's activity in our life, that healing, those blessings, his provisions, his work in our life should lead us to minister for God and to others. It's just that simple. So she was raised up and she waited, she ministered to them. Verse 16. And it came about the evening that they brought to him, and notice the difference, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. 
Now, we see here, and in the Gospels, and by the way, if you look at the rabbinical writings at this time, we see that there too was an emphasis on demonic possession. Many people don't tell you that. Many people aren't aware of that. But when you look, for example, in the, the Talmud, you will find in other writings that there was a, a demonic plague, so to speak, at this time, meaning this. When Messiah came the first time, there was great demonic influence. And likewise, when he comes again, and he's coming again, and I believe that soon, there will also be great demonic influence. And that's why we need to pay great attention to this passage of Scripture and learn from it once more. And when it came about the evening, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits, how? By the word. I would emphasize that. It was the word once more. We need to learn two things. He could speak just like God the Father and bring things into being, bring things into a godly order. Secondly, there's power in the word. It is through the word that demonic influence, demons themselves, are defeated, that they are cast out. So, he cast out the spirits by the world, word, and all, everyone who had, and your Bible may say sickness, but it's the word kakos. Why is that important? The word kakos isn't the word for sickness or disease. It's a word for that which is evil. And here's what the scripture's doing. There is this direct relationship between demons and that which is evil. When we do that which is evil, that which violates the truth of God, it's going to bring demonic activity into our life. Now, we may not recognize that. We may not see the demons, but they will be active. They will be moving. Very important that we'll see that. We'll talk later on. For example, we're in chapter 8. When we get into chapter 13 of, of Matthew, we'll talk more about demonic possession, how evil spirits work. We'll learn these principles. But now, we'll stay on what the Scripture is speaking about here. So, by the Word, it says, He cast these evil spirits out, and all that had evil, we see here, they were healed. Here again, they didn't heal themselves. It didn't just happen over time. He brought it about. And verse 17, this is important scripture. And at times, you know, we all need to, to confess. See, God hates pride. He loves individuals that will humble themselves. And in Isaiah 53, I've always been one, always been one, to say that Isaiah 53 oftentimes is misappropriated because people will say, you know, by what Messiah did, his stripes, when, when he suffered for sin, by this, we're, we're healed. And I always want to say we're healed from a sinful influence, but don't take that out of context. And clearly the context there is being healed from sin. But I've always said don't apply that to physical disease and sicknesses, but I was wrong. Because when we look here at this scripture, it's clear. Look at verse 17. Opos, that means, and so that the word through Isaiah the prophet should be fulfilled. The New Testament, which is an authoritative, it's scripture, it's the word of God, but it's also an authoritative commentary on the old. We see the right understanding, or an additional understanding in this case, where it says, Thus the word of the prophet Isaiah was fulfilled, saying, He took our, our sickness and our diseases he bore. So part of the suffering of Messiah was to produce not just the forgiveness of sins and to curtail, to end, to bring to a stop sinful influence in our life and the punishment of sin, but also 
He suffered because of our diseases and sicknesses as well. Verse 18. And Yeshua, seeing the, the many crowds around him, we read that he commanded to go away to the other side and came to him as he was doing that, it says, and came to him one of the scribes that said to him, Teacher. Now, he's having, based upon these miracles, he's making headway in the religious community. Notice what the scripture says here. One of the scribes, make no mistake about it, as he was getting ready to go to the other side, one of the scribes came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow after you wherever you go away. Meaning, whenever you go away, I am going to be with you. Doesn't matter where, I'm going to be there. But notice what Messiah says to him. Read on, verse, verse 20. And Yeshua says to him, the foxes, they have their, their dens, their holds, and the birds of the heaven, they have their nests. But in contrast to that, something different. The Son of Man does not have where to lie his head. Meaning he has no earthly security. In other words, he doesn't have a place, a home, a dwelling place in this world. Why is that? Because he belongs to the kingdom of God. And what he's teaching his disciples is that same thing. We do not find security. We do not belong to this world. As, as other writers of the New Covenant says, we are aliens, we are sojourners, we are foreigners in this world. Why? Because we belong to the kingdom of heaven. That's where our citizenship is. So don't look, don't believe that faith is going to give us a physical, physical security in this world. Quite the opposite. He had no place to lay his head. Move on. We read verse 21. But another, this is a different one of his disciples, not one of the twelve, but he had other disciples, said to him, Lord, Permit me, I, I want to follow you, I believe in you, but he says, permit me first to go away and to bury my father. Now, this is seen in Judaism as a, a responsibility, an obligation. Now, here again, not one that someone dreads and, and doesn't like, no. We want to honor our parents. And he says, you know, I'll, I'll be committed to you, I'll follow you wherever you go. I understand what you're saying, no earthly security. But, but first, allow me to fulfill this, this obligation. Let me bury my father first. Verse 22, notice his response. And Yeshua says to him, follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. What he's saying is this, don't be so concerned with the ceremony, with everything. The world puts such a great significance on the burial. Now, there are some, some religious overtones to a proper burial, but they are to reveal spiritual truth. In other words, a, a godly burial is to be a witness. But that doesn't, we just don't wait around for that event. And saying, in the meantime, I'm not going to serve God. I'm not going to do what he wants me to do. No. The time is short. We need to redeem these evil days. And that's why he says, no, you follow me and let the dead bury the dead. There is an urgency to respond now. Verse, verse 22, what did he say? Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead dead verse 23 and and he embarked he was going over to the other side and now he embarked in that boat and it says and his disciples followed him and behold look now at verse 24 a very important text 
Matthew 8, verse 24. He's going over to the other side. And that term, Sad Acher in Hebrew, Sidra Achra in, in Aramaic, it's written about by the sages of Judaism. And it, usually this other side implies a demonic world, going over to the world of darkness. And notice what's going to happen. When we do that, that enemy doesn't like that, when we go there for the purpose of ministry. This is spiritual warfare. The enemy doesn't like it. And he says, he gets in the boat, he's going, and verse 24, and behold, seismos. Now, we all know what a seismograph is. This is what measures an earthquake. Some Bibles will say a tempest, a great wind, but it's not that. What happens is an earthquake. That's what the scripture's revealing here. A great earthquake came about in the sea, meaning under the sea, so that, so that, that the boat, what happens, the boat was, was covered by the waves. And when this was happening, this earthquake happened, and suddenly, as they were traveling to the other side, the waves, kind of like a tsunami on the Sea of Galilee, took place. And these waves were beating against and coming over the boat, into the boat. But what was he doing? He was sleeping. Verse 25. And his disciples, now notice, we're going to see in the last few moments, it speaks about disciples coming to him. That first one, I'll follow you anywhere. Then I'll follow you, but let me bury the dead. And now his disciples were speaking to the 12 disciples. His 12 disciples came to him saying, Lord, save, meaning save us, for we are perishing. Now realize, they are in a safe position. Why? They are with Messiah. They are following him in his will. There's not a safer place to be. But realize, there's going to be the attacks of the enemy. And that is seen in this natural world through an earthquake. The world doesn't want the ministry of Messiah. They don't want him to bring about the change that he brings about. So in this portion of scripture, we see they say, Lord, save us, for we are perishing. And he says to them, verse 26, what are you fearful of? Now, literally he says, why are you fearful once? That's not, not proper. We should not be fearful of the things of this world. No, we should give fear and awe and respect to God, not what the enemy does. He says, look now, he says, little ones of faith. Now, notice the correlation between these things. He calls them fearful ones. And then he says, you who are little in faith. When we are little in faith, we are going to fear the things of this world and fear the activity of the enemy. We ought not. When we are bold and strong in the faith, we're going to know, remember what we talked about last week, we're going to know the authority of God. That authority, that anointing will be on us. And with that power, not our own, but with His power from the Holy Spirit, we can defeat the enemy. We don't fear them, but we defeat them. But in this situation, the disciples, they're not walking. They don't understand their authority. And that's why He says, you fearful ones, you ones of little faith, and then... He got up, and it says, he rebuked, rebuked the wind, the wind and the sea. And there came about, came about a great, now notice, that word mega was used in regard to that earthquake that came about. And all the other things that was happening, there was many sources that the enemy was trying to defeat Yeshua. And he, in an instance, why? 
because of his authority. He spoke, and immediately we read in the scripture that there came about a great stillness or a great quietness. And then look at verse 27. There is a change in terminology. And whenever there's a change in terminology, understand there's significance in that. Now, what we've been looking at, it says over and over, disciple, disciple. Then we change to his disciples, his disciples. And because they are fearful ones and little in faith, we see in verse 27 a change. He doesn't call them his disciples. What does he call them? He calls them men. Men meaning just regular individuals. So we have to ask ourselves a question. And what is that question? Who are we behaving like? Just common individuals, just mere men? Or are we recognizing in Messiah that we are a new creation? In Him, we don't need to fear the things of this world or the things of that other side, that, that enemy, that evil, spiritual, satanic enemy, these demonic influences. We don't need to fear them. Why? Because through great faith, we have great authority. What does that mean? Through faith, we have power. And the one in us, that Holy Spirit, he is greater than those in the world. So we, under that authority, what did he do? Messiah, he's the example. That's why so frequently he's called the Son of Man. He's the example. He rebukes. He rebukes the wind and the sea, and in an instant, there is a great stillness. Now, think about that. If what I said, this word seismos, if it speaks about not only a storm coming, but also an earthquake, we see that there should be ongoing outcomes. When there's an earthquake, that, that force will cause the waves. And they'll continue for a period of time. Not so. Yeshua spoke and immediately there was this great calmness and this great quietness. That's what this word means. And notice it says, and the men, doesn't say disciples, but the men, speaking about the disciples, they marveled. And notice what it says. They spoke. What is this one? Now, it's not who, but the word that appears here, potapos, speaks about what, what type. They, it shows that they really didn't understand who the rabbi was. Not just that he is the Messiah, but who Messiah is, the Son of God. He has absolute authority. No, they saw him as a spiritual leader. They saw him as their teacher. They saw him as a miracle worker, but, you know, there was others doing miracles. When we get into chapter 13, it speaks about those who are the sons of the rabbinical leaders. They were casting out demons. By who? They were casting out demons. But he is God among them. And that's why they, these men, they marveled and were saying, of what type is this one? I mean, they were, were impressed that he's different than just the regular man. That also the wind and the sea obey him. Now, here's the key. This type of authority, the authority that, that has its origin in the heavens among God, it is an absolute authority. All things, hear that, all things bow the knee to this type of authority. And here's the good news for us. When we receive the gospel, immediately, immediately, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He comes to dwell in us. 
in order that the same authority, that same, remember that Greek word, exousia, it is a word of authority and also power, the very power of God. The Holy Spirit, He dwells within us in order that through His anointing, that we can walk in that authority and that we can be recipients of that power, not to accomplish my will, but to accomplish God's will. And that's what Messiah was going to that other side to do in order to accomplish the will of his heavenly father and to be a testimony that through Messiah, this demonic power, this force of evil, those things that are in conflict with the truth of God and the purpose of God, that they would be rendered powerless. We become powerful, they become powerless. Why? Well, here's the objective. We have taught, we have seen, and we will continue to see. All of this is so that righteousness will be manifested. And why is that so important? because there's that inherent relationship between righteousness and the glory of God. See, we engage in good works, we deal with the will of God in order that righteousness is established so that the glory of God is released. Why? Well, when God's glory is released, what's going to be the outcome? The answer is worship. And that's what primarily is the call upon my life and the call upon every believer that we behave in such a way that it leads others to worship God because worship that is why we have been created that is why we have been saved that is why we are here that we might have a lifestyle a behavior a testimony that leads others to worship God with us now, you ask me, what is my day, this day and every day about? It is about living in a worshipful manner. And if you want to know about victory, you want to know about success. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. doesn't matter how that enemy's functioning. But if you continue to worship God, you are living the most successful life, a victorious life. Don't allow the circumstances of your life keeping you from worshiping God. Well, I'll close with that until next week. May God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.